Darwin Cook, born November 16, 1962 in Toronto, Canada. Although his bibliography isn't stacked with decades worth of material, he'd become known as a symbol of quality anytime his name graced a front cover. His love for the medium spun out of the Adam West Batman TV series, which only built with the first comics that he picked up. Titles such as The Spectacular Spider-Man, Detective Comics, and Will Eisner's The Spirit. It was seeing John Romita Sr.'s work in particular that had him run into a craft shop at the age of 13 to buy markers and boards to begin his path towards becoming one of the underrated giants of the industry. And despite being expelled from college and hearing doubts from his construction worker father and also entering the scene during an era of hyper-detailed photorealistic artists bringing out multiple titles a month, Darwin Cook with his deceptively simple, clean style and selective projects found a way to break out and solidify himself as one of the best in the medium. And in this video, we're going to explore how we made that possible. We're both Hey guys, it's me Marcus aka The Mad Dog and we're back with the third episode of Notable Works. The series that, admittedly, I kind of stole off from his corner where he takes a life and career of a fighter and sums it up in just five fights. But instead, we take a comic creator and the works that they gave us to paint a biography of their life. And today we're focusing on Darwin Cook, who was one of my favourite storytellers that was unfortunately taken too soon. Hopefully this video goes some way to preserving his legacy as we take a look at the five most important books that he worked on. So yeah, your favourite might not necessarily be in here, and I'm not saying that these are the best, but they're the five most important in telling the story of his career. So let's go through them in chronological order, because this is Darwin Cook's top five notable works. Batman Ego Although the first book in this list was published in the year 2000, Cook first showed his artwork to DC in 1985, when he ventured out to their New York office to show samples of what he could do. This got him a five-page illustrating feature in New Talent Showcase issue 19, but the harsh criticism of his father that he'd heard from his childhood wasn't without merit, as the $35 a year per page just wasn't enough to sustain a career within the industry. Darwin then moved back to Canada, and for the next 15 years worked a variety of different jobs, such as art director, product, and graphic designer along with opening up his own studio. During the 90s, he did try to get his work in front of comic publishers, but didn't receive much in the way of a response, until he responded to an advert for storyboard artists on a little-known TV show. I doubt anyone would have heard of it. It was that small, but it's Batman the Animated Series. I think that's how you pronounce it. The advert was posted by Bruce Timm himself, and because he knew it was an opportunity too big to pass up, Cook moved to Los Angeles so that he could dive headfirst into the position. He did the storyboards for a few episodes on the new Batman Adventures, Superman the Animated Series, and even did a year over at the Men in Black cartoon in two episodes of the long-forgotten Buzz Lightyear of Star Command. But preamble aside, in 1994, to get his foot in the door, he drew and scripted a 14-page pitch that got him the job, but the story he made was thrown into a pile with all the others. It was only four years later when art director Mark Chiarello was throwing out old pitches that he stumbled on Cook's proposal and saw the potential in it. That would inspire Cook to revisit the idea and expand it into the 64-page graphic novel released in the year 2000, Batman Ego. The story, described by the man himself as what if Batman and Bruce Wayne were able to sit down and talk about what it is that they do, was inspired by the 1981 movie My Dinner with Andre, which despite me doing a lot of research for this video, I'm in no rush to hunt this down and watch it. The duality between Batman and Bruce Wayne is on full display here, as Cook borrowed into the psychosis of the billionaire turned vigilante in the aftermath of Batman inadvertently causing the murder suicide of a low level criminal, all due to his inability to kill the Joker. In a quest to explore the why behind Batman, Bruce Wayne separates his two personas to find some way to be comfortable with breaking his one rule. Although very raw and on the nose in its exploration, it was a clear sign that Cook could craft an engaging, thought provoking narrative with a true understanding of the character he was writing about and get to the core of the person behind the mask and carry that across a full story. From an art standpoint, there are clear moments where the animated series influenced his work, but while still displaying the early signs of his signature moves that Cook incorporated into his style. Clean lines, bold expressions, and a dynamic perspective. Interestingly as well, Cook did his own colouring, which is something that he wouldn't do often. As well, I bring this point up here because unless you're looking for the differences, it's hard to notice a major difference between Cook doing his own colouring and having the likes of Matt Hollingsworth or Dave Stewart taking on those duties. And that's no disrespect to either of those guys, but it's just showing how much skill Cook had from the beginning, and also how he'd set the tone for how his work would be seen moving forward. So although it may have only been 64 pages, and never Cook's initial intention for it to be anything more than a pitch for an animation job, Batman Ego was the entry into the comics industry that Darwin had been yearning for since he was 13, with the character that got him introduced into the medium. And more importantly than that, at the age of 37, Darwin Cook had finally made it, but he was just getting started. Catwoman 
So where do you go after leading your own Batman story without the shackles of continuity holding it down? If you're Darwin Cook, the next move is over to Catwoman. In the early 2000s, Darwin met up with Ed Brubaker, who wasn't the huge name that he is today, but he and Darwin wanted to work together on something that would have meaning for the both of them. And out of the plethora of characters from the Batman universe that they could have picked from, Slam Bradley was the one that they bonded over. The little known detective that had faded in and out of various titles since Detective Comics issue 1 back in 1938. But they both knew they needed a hook if they were going to take a chance on a lesser known character. And just one month before the duo's first published work together, Catwoman was presumed dead by the hands of Deathstroke the Terminator in issue 94 of her own series. Although hardly an obscure character, Selina Kyle wasn't the name it once was, with countless writers checking in and out of the series and there never being much buzz. Unless her issues tied into one of the big events of the 90s, or they pretty much made her look naked on the front cover. Catwoman's like a great character. It's been horribly treated for a long time, I think. So that's the perfect place to jump in. And they were allowing a redesign, so everything about it was right. Kicking things off in a series of eight-page backup features in Greg Rucker's Detective Comics issues 759 to 762, Slam Bradley hits the mean streets of Gotham City on the trail of Selina Kyle. The serial was fun and felt like the love child of Cook's Parker series and Brubaker's Reckless, and featured a far more polished and fun style from Cook that showcased a massive improvement from Batman Ego. But fun isn't the reason why it's on this list. So if you're having fun, Stop that right now. But teased at the end of the final backup was a new ongoing series for Catwoman. Together, Cook and Brubaker took that essence of a promiscuous burglar in Gotham City that's always crossing paths with Batman, but reinvented a costume, ensemble, and bring her family back into the lovable anti-hero role that she was always meant to be in. No longer was she just the generic sexy female character that the 90s had become littered with, but they also added a new layer to a mystique that had long been overlooked. We're gonna see the character sort of, you know, re-established and regain her strength, uh, sort of a, you know, a sense of purpose in her life. Uh, visually, it's completely different, you know, it could be more different, and um, I'm very interested in, in what people are going to think of it in those terms. I think it's probably the, if I dare say this, it's, I'm not going to say it's the best, but I think it's one of the smartest costumes that she's ever worn, and uh, I think it's it's like a no-brainer type of thing, it's like, why did, why did she look like this from the get? At the same time, the line work had been tightened up, maturing further into the style that Cook would become synonymous with, and got a chance to display a great range of emotions and narrative complexities that he was unable to during Ego. Additionally, with the assistance of Mike Allred on inking duties and Matt Hollingsworth on colours, Cook was able to focus primarily on the penciling duties, which is why it felt like such a step up from Batman Ego. With the help of Brubaker, he was able to assert himself back into the mainstream DC universe, where there were no questions as to whether or not this was continuity, only further evidenced by the fact that this look for Catwoman has pretty much been the go-to ever since. Even looking at Jim Lee's Hush or King's recent run on Batman, it's clear the influence of Cook's depiction is still key. Despite leaving the Brubaker-led title after issue 4 in April of 2002, just five months later Darwin brought out the real reason why Catwoman is one of his most notable works. Selina's Big Score, a 90-page prequel to the Brubaker run written and illustrated entirely by Cook, with Hollingsworth returning on colours, it saw Selina returning to Gotham City and desperate for that one big score whilst most of the people who know her still think she's dead. The story is a perfect mix of anti-hero in the DC universe, heists, and a crime noir tone that now feels necessary for anything revolving around the Bat family. And although his previous work had ventured into a grittier vibe, Selina's big score carried that throughout without Cook ever compromising on what made his art so special. Instead, he focused on the pacing and had the time to build tension in scenes and showcased his talent through the use of multiple locations so that it couldn't just be labelled as cartoony. When reflecting on the book in 2007, Cook called it the single single thing I did that I liked the most. Which is interesting as it's one of his biggest works that wasn't set apart from regular continuity. I bring this up because Cook often seemed to be in conflict with what modern comics wanted, and what he wanted comics to be. If we're talking about mainstream comics, uh, I, I think there have been a lot of real tactical errors made in uh, this century. I can't really read superhero comics anymore. They've become so dark and violent and uh, sexualized, and I, I, I think it's a real wrong turn. Selena's big score feels like the epitome of what Cook believed comics should be, whilst also contributing to the bigger picture of Catwoman within the DC Universe. Thankfully, this is still very accessible today and a great jumping on point for Catwoman, especially thanks to the Omnibus that was released the other year. And if you wanted to pick up this or any other books and support the channel at the same time so that I can continue to make videos like this, then make sure that you use the discount codes that we've got with the channel's sponsor, 
organic rice books. They've got great packaging, fast shipping, and amazing customer services. And if you use code woof woof, you'll get two dollars off your order. And if you're ordering three or more books and you want them to be delivered together, make sure you use code woof woof ship it together for five percent off your entire order. Don't worry, you can just copy and paste them from the description down below, and you can use these codes as many times as you like. So yeah, I'm kind of cheating on this pick by throwing in a few different series. But just a few years into his professional comics career, Darwin, with the help of Ed Brubaker, was reshaping long established characters and bringing them back to the forefront, shedding them of an unfair label that had plagued them for the previous decade. It was Cook growing in confidence and getting comfortable with the impact his stories could have, which is why the next big score he went for had to be something that would really show what he could do. DC The New Frontier Despite being released in 2004, Darwin had been brainstorming an idea since finishing Batman Ego. He'd been pushed to do a Justice League book, but the modern continuity wasn't what interested him, and instead wanted to go back to craft a story that highlighted what made these characters great before the edgy era broke Batman's back, killed Superman, and made Hal Jordan a traitorous murderer. To do that, he knew he needed to revisit the era when he liked these characters best, and started formulating a story that bridged the gap between the Golden and Silver Age, and explore who these characters were before they formed the Justice League. Yet the DC editorial board didn't agree with Cook's vision and pushed for it to connect to the modern continuity. Fortunately, then president of DC Comics Paul Levitz saw the potential and passion in the series and allowed Cook to follow his original idea and offered him a payment advance for his work. Which I guess you guys can kind of do for this channel by clicking the join button down below. This allowed Darwin the freedom that he needed to craft a story that incorporated all of the themes that he enjoyed the most. The emergence of superheroes, the shifting of the guard from the golden to the silver age, and the hysteria and uncertainty of the Cold War era America, but contrasted against a sense of optimism. DC The New Frontier's first issue released in March of 2004, and there was nothing else like it. Taking inspiration from artists of the era like Jack Kirby, but still infusing his signature style, the figures were bright, clean, and a bit blocky at the same time. The colours, done by Dave Stewart, were saturated, bold, and vibrant to capture the sense of whimsy that Cook wanted. Working primarily with just three panels a page, it shed the burden of modern comic layouts and reverted back to a style that gave each moment a chance to breathe. Although Cook stacked the book top to bottom with references, to the point where there's a guide in the collected editions. And yeah, that commentary is also included in the recently re-released Deluxe Edition, which if you wanted to pick that up and you're from the EU, then the only place that you need to go is Comics Bugle. They've been a massive support to this channel and keeping the lights on, and they've got phenomenal free shipping and they give you free gifts with every order. And you can also get 3% off all items that aren't already in a sale if you use code woof woof. So make sure you get in your orders in. So the art may have caught everyone's attention, and it's clear to see why, but it was the story that kept people engaged for the six issues. And for a story set in an era when the superheroics was the focus, Cook went in the opposite direction, and focused on the person behind the mask. I've never really appreciated the, the immense burden that Superman carries around, you know? I, I look at all these uh, normal characters and I think, wow, they're, they're, you know, there's a far more heroic journey they're on because, you know, they're mortal, they can be, they can be hurt. Well, the Green Lantern ring is pretty powerful, though. Yes, it is. And again, you will notice that uh, in Frontier, we wait all the way to the bloody end before uh, I let that become an issue in mm -hmm. Hell's life. Because yeah, at that point, things do take off in another direction. And I was far more interested in him as a person. New Frontier was Cook showcasing how much he could really do as a storyteller. It wouldn't be controversial to call it his magnum opus, and it was only four years after Batman Ego. He wasn't confined to the parameters of a 14-page pitch, or working within the rules of a continuity that someone else created. He could truly breathe and bring new perspectives to the page for longtime fan favourite characters like Barry Allen, Martian Manhunter, Hal Jordan and the Justice League. At the heart of it all was just that, heart, adding new layers to a time period where emotional maturity wasn't a priority and bringing a newfound love and appreciation to an audience like myself that wasn't around during the Silver Age. The response was overwhelmingly positive, with Cook receiving the accolades he'd never thought possible when leaving the industry in the 80s, and New Frontier was a sweep at the awards, bagging Best Limited Series, Best Colouring, and Best Publication Design at the Eisners, Best Artist, Best Colorist, and Best Continuing or Limited Series at the Harvey Awards, and also receiving a Shushter. As soon as it was finished, it was already seen as an all-time classic for both new readers and old, with the series being immortalised in an absolute edition, which also won a Harvey and Eisner Award. And DC had such faith in the property that New Frontier was selected to be the second film in WB's DC Universe animated original movies line, with a direct-to-DVD release in 2008. It gave Cook the chance to work with Bruce Timm again and return
return to his animation roots, combining the story he'd poured his soul into with a career that afforded him that opportunity in the first place. Yet, this adaption wasn't as plain sailing as the book. Being the follow-up release after Superman Doomsday the year earlier, Justice League The New Frontier didn't have as wide of an impact as a comic, or within the animated community, despite receiving some award nominations and positive reviews. Also, the journey to getting the movie completed doesn't sound as rewarding as Cook might have anticipated. Animation, it literally takes maybe what, a thousand, fifteen hundred people to come together in a unified fashion. To, to execute something like this and I just didn't see it happening you know I didn't see I didn't see it coming together the way I would have been happy with it and if there's one thing I've learned about New Frontier it doesn't matter what it is about it I'm associated with it my name's kind of on the brand. The story had to be shortened, the focus was shifted to the bigger name Justice League characters, and Cook had to fight for Wonder Woman and Lois Lane to be kept in the movie. But regardless, DC The New Frontier is Cook's crowning achievement, and is still his most popular project 20 years after it was first released. It taught him that he can craft whatever story he wanted to, and disregarded the shackles of continuity, and he had evolved from his days doing animation, and could comfortably leave that behind. He'd put his stamp on the characters he loved, and although Jeff Johns' Green Lantern rebirth came out in December the same year, and is credited as a reason why Hal Jordan could be seen as a hero once again, the portrayal Cook gave us in The New Frontier deserves some of that praise too. It was everything he'd wanted to create since he entered the industry, and after a title like that, most creators would probably lose steam or retire, so it posed a very important question. What was next for Cook? The Spirit after The New Frontier, Darwin experienced a level of rarefied air that few creators get to achieve at any point in their professional careers, let alone after just a few years. He could take any project, had pick of the litter if he wanted to team up with another creator, and the option was always there if he wanted to resume his work in animation. But few series caught his interest whilst he was working on the Justice League The New Frontier movie. Sure, he did an issue for Solo, the art for Green Lantern Secret Files, and an arc in Superman Confidential, but a development happened in the mid-2000s that would give Cook the opportunity to work on one of the characters that got him into the medium, the spirit. And yeah, I realise there's some irony there with me saying medium and spirit in the same sentence. I'm just too dumb to figure it out. Now the behind the scenes history of this character is… extensive to say the least. It seems like a video in its own right. But long story short, Will Eisner, the guy the award's named after, and also the creator of the spirit, retained the rights to the character even after the original publisher, Quality Comics, was acquired by DC. Following Eisner's death in 2005, the rights were then transferred back across to DC, and in November of 2006, Darwin Cook worked on the one-shot crossover between Batman and the Spirit, taking on the art duties and co-writing alongside Jeff Loeb. The titular characters head to Hawaii, with Bruce Wayne and Denny Colt teaming up to thwart the rogues gallery in their plot against the American Criminologist Association. The art was bombastic, sharp, and added an extra layer of dynamism that set it apart from Cook's previous work. It was clear on every page the adoration Cook had for both of these characters, which led to the crossover winning the Eisner for Best Single Issue. It's not 100% clear where this sits within the timeline, but what is clear is that the spirit was now part of DC continuity, and Cook, with the help of Loeb, had been the one to usher that in. But he wasn't done with Denny Colt. I, at first I said I didn't think so, mm -hmm. because, you know, come on, what are you doing? Stepping in the footsteps of giants. After a couple days uh, of thinking about it, it occurred to me, as long as it was placed in the present day, that gave me 50 mm. years of social trends and things that have come about that Will didn't have. I thought, geez, if we're in the present world, there's a whole new set of circumstances we could put him in. Then I got excited about it because I wouldn't just be echoing or mimicking his work as much as I could sort of add to to it with some of the things that have happened in the last, you know, little while. The next month, the Spirit Issue 1 released, the first ongoing series for the character in nearly a decade, and the first published by DC Comics. Cook both wrote and illustrated the title for the first year, with the exception of Issue 7, and helmed a run that incorporated classic Spirit stories, but updated for a modern audience. It was a mystery adventure book that harkened back to the 50s, but with the benefits of modern society, and less the undertones that would feel wrong if they'd carried on. Once again, he cut to the heart of the Spirit, and took him on a personal journey that added extra nuances to the character. The art, although personally I felt the Batman crossover was his better work, had still evolved and had these phenomenal flashback scenes within them. For the modern scenes, Jay Bone did the inking, but in the flashbacks, Cook took over it and showed how far he could take his style when fully in control. Surprisingly though, Cook announced that he'd be leaving the book at issue 12, citing Jay Bone being unavailable for a second year is his reason for ending his tenure on the book. However, if I could become a conspiracy theorist for just a moment, I feel like this decision was part of a bigger learning curve within Cook's career. 
career. When speaking about the CVs, Cook remarked, And then with number 10, the legal department came in hmm. and made all kinds of idiotic notes on the book. And they were, they were idiotic. Admit it, guys. <laughs> and I refused to change it because it was, it wasn't being changed for any real legal reason I could see. It was just, they were, they were augmenting what I had done to, to their taste, so I wouldn't do it. And that led to the editor rewriting uh, parts of 10. And that took the wind out of all of our sales yeah. at that point. Now, sure, Cook's official reason that he didn't want to continue with the title if his team wasn't available probably has a lot of validity. But coming from a huge title like New Frontier and effectively having free reign to the pressures of a regular monthly title for a character that had so much history and meaning to Cook and having other people come in and interfere with his work just might not have brought the same joy as his more personal projects and wanted to do books that could be unapologetically his and have that freedom. But in order to accomplish that, he really needed to switch things up. Richard Starks Parker In my research for this video, I couldn't help but notice that Cook showed a pessimistic look towards the comic industry the longer that he remained in it. In 2007, following the news that his time on the spirit was coming to an end, he proclaimed that there is no room in the direct market for new ideas. You can go into DC and pitch new ideas all day long, but they don't want them. If you want to capture a new audience or take your work out into a broader area, that's something you have to do outside because they're not built to do that type of work anymore. I, I think that everybody in the world likes and understands what a comic is, except right. for the people in the direct market. Right. Now, no, case in point, I'm, I'm going to prove my point right here, right now. They do a movie called Batman Begins. So DC's reaction was kill Bruce Wayne. So anyone coming in off the movie to buy a Batman comic won't know what the fuck is going on. It's, it's so trapped within itself, it doesn't even understand, right. you know. Uh, the world outside of it or what's there. It makes sense then that his output in 2008 was limited mostly to an issue or two of Jonah Hex and a special issue for DC The New Frontier. To an outsider looking in, that's not a lot, but everything started to make sense the year after when he moved over to IDW to make a graphic novel adaption of Richard Stark's Parker, The Hunter. Taking the story from a 155 page novel that was published in 1962, it was a crime thriller that follows a professional robber that gets betrayed prior to the book starting and is out for revenge. Although Although it may seem somewhat obscure, for Cook's next big project, it couldn't be less surprising when seeing the influence that Donald E. Westlake had had throughout his career. During his stint on Catwoman, Cook had shelved the concept in which Catwoman's ex-lover, who was also called Stark, came back for revenge, taking inspiration from the 1967 movie Point Blank, which was an adaptation of The Hunter. The time period isn't too far removed from that which he'd explored during the New Frontier, and the crime noir tone is one that Cook had become well versed in throughout his career, but that didn't mean he was willing to take it easy. Despite being a lifelong fan of the character, Cook sought out the approval of creator Donald Westlake to ensure that a pure version of his creation was being presented. But unfortunately, Westlake passed away in December of 2008, meaning that the pressure of perfecting the Hunter's story weighed heavy on Cook. He was determined to preserve the legacy of one of his favourite fictional characters while still making it his own. And he did just that. Released in July of 2009, Richard Stark's Parker the Hunter exploded into the comic scene. Fans of the original series and people being introduced to it through Cook's work were instantly hooked, and the appeal dared to stretch beyond the regular comic reading community. A release day press conference was held for the title, the media were given review copies in advance, and even the New York Times covered the release. And that's all well and good that he was able to push the boat out and bring in readers that may have never touched a comic before, but it was the world that Cook brought to the page that made it such a success. If DC The New Frontier was Darwin's magnum opus, the Parker series was a perfect capstone. The storytelling had been refined and perfected, taking the pacing techniques he developed from Ego to allow Parker the time it needed to emerge itself in Westlake's world. Cook himself claimed the style he adopted was woven into his backup stories on Slam Bradley and Selena's Big Score, except now he didn't have to feel the pressure of modern comic continuity. The 60s era was one that he was well versed in through his work in DC The New Frontier, and the art style, although primarily using watercolour, was handled solely by Cook, which I imagine the flashback scenes in the spirit only helped his confidence in his storytelling ability. What's most impressive was how well Cook carried the plot, even when it could go dozens of pages without a single word. Instead, he mastered posture, expression, light and angles to bring us into Parker's life. It felt like a culmination of everything Darwin had been doing over the nine years prior, with the freedom he'd been yearning for away from the direct market. And little did we know at the time that this series would be his swan song. Between October 2010 and December 2013, Cook released a further three Parker stories, The Outfit, The Score and Slayground, each of which being a worthy addition to the series. The original deal with IDW intended for the four contracted books to be released within eight years 
years. But the passion Darwin had for this series was palpable with each page turn, which meant that he completed the contract three years early. Thought had gone into every aspect to protect the legacy of a character that he held in such high regard. With even the monochrome, almost black and white style chosen to preserve authenticity and subvert the exaggerated visuals that previous adaptations had adopted. And with such a wow factor, you'd think that Cook must have had an extensive draft process. But Westlake had a process that Cook wanted to channel of creating as he went along and never going back to undo his mistakes. Hence why the second book, The Outfit, only took around four months to complete after researching. Much like The New Frontier, Parker was a huge favourite when it came to the awards, with three out of the four titles winning Best Adaption from Another Medium at the Eisners, along with Best Writer Artist for The Outfit, along with a handful of Harvey Awards. And one of the most beautiful collected editions that's ever existed with Martini hardcovers. Although he did a few additional projects during this time, such as a Before Watchmen series and a planned title over at Image, Cook wanted to stick with Parker for a long time. I am not sure there might be two more, and there might only be one more. Um, and then who knows what the future holds, because frankly, I, you know, I can see Parker and I getting along, you know, for as long as I can hold a pencil. Um, but, but he will return, but it probably won't be till 2016. But over the course of your career, maybe once, twice if you're lucky, you're given that one job you knew you were born to do, or the one thing that, was abs that is absolutely the perfect thing for you, for your voice, and you know, definitely Parker's that for me. But despite a further project, Butcher's Moon being announced, Slayground was the last published full Parker story before Darwin Cook unfortunately died of cancer on May 14th, 2016. To wrap this video up, there are many interesting what if questions throughout the history of comics. What if Jack Kirby hadn't left Marvel? What if Image Comics was never founded? And the one I often ask myself whilst researching this video, what if Darwin Cook hadn't left comics in the 80s? His unfortunate passing at the age of 53 means that we'll never know the answer to that last question. But if the outpouring of respect and the wake of his death was anything to go by, it's clear that he did enough in his 16 years within the industry to be solidified as one of the greats. Sure, his style wasn't desired when he first entered the scene in the 80s, but through the stories he created, he became one of the pioneers for the retro modern style that is now back in the popular eye. Although he doesn't have the largest catalogue of work, what Darwin does does have is a plethora of huge titles that show how he developed as a storyteller, an artist, and also how his mentality as a creator changed over the years. He re-entered the industry by a stroke of luck, but due to his perseverance and commitment to his vision of what the craft should be, he managed to make it so that every book he worked on was like an event. Through the archival footage that I found, it's clear that Cook was a consummate professional, a perfectionist in many different disciplines, and more than anything, a kind gentleman who had time for everyone. And I don't see as many people speaking about him in the years since his passing, but his legacy can't be erased. And if there's been at least one person watching this who's learned a little bit more about the life of Darwin Cook and absorbed that message that it's never too late to follow your dreams no matter how many times you might have already been pushed back. And if any of that has happened as a result of this video, then it was worth making it. But whether you loved it or hated it, that's the video. And until next time, just make sure that you stay safe and stay mad all you dogs. We're both. See you at the next video.